Hi everyone, this is Nathan Park with the National Housing Conference. Um, we are going to go ahead and get started today. Uh, thank you for joining us for our first webinar um, of 2020 and of the new decade. We're excited um, that you all are joining us and uh, excited to learn from our uh, great panelists today about um, the uh, economic outlook for the um, housing economy this upcoming year. Um, I'm going to do a quick run through of the agenda. We are first going to um, have some updates from NHC, uh, some brief introductions, and then we're going to dive right into um, our presentations. Um, after that, we are going to have uh, some time for a question and answer. Uh, and I just want to point everyone towards um, some of the uh, inter interface with the Zoom um, uh, technology. Uh, at, everyone should be muted right now. If you are not on mute, please mute now so that um, we don't have any interruptions during the presentation. Um, and then at the end, we're going to have some time for folks to ask some questions. Uh, so if you want uh, to ask a question, you can do so at the end, or if you want to write it down before you forget it um, as the presentations progress, you can use the Zoom chat option. Um, so in your little toolbar, you should see an op option for uh, chatting, and please feel free uh, to submit questions in there. Um, with that, we have a few announcements from NHC. The first uh, is uh, for folks to join NHC. Um, for those of you who are online and who have either uh, or are joining us today and who have not uh, renewed your membership for the 2020 year or who um, are not currently uh, NHC members, uh, we really encourage you all to join. There is a bunch of great benefits, um, one of which includes webinars like this. So for today, we're excited to bring you this webinar. Um, regardless of if you remember or not, but uh, as we move forward in the future, other webinars like this that hopefully we, uh, that hopefully you all find useful will be um, limited to our members. Uh, so please check out our website to learn more about joining. Uh, and then the other announcement is that we have our, one of our signature events coming up um, in the coming months, uh, Solutions for Housing Communications, where we convene uh, a bunch of industry experts uh, on how exactly we um, communicate and, and better advocate for uh, housing. Um, so we have some uh, great uh, topics already set up, including advocating to end homelessness, um, how to message for affordable housing, uh, and what the future of housing news is going to look like. Um, so early bird registration is open now. Please go and register online, save some money, and we hope to see you all there. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to David Dorkin, the President and CEO of the National Housing Conference, who is going to introduce our uh, panel of speakers. Thank you, Nathan. Um, yeah, we've got a great uh, panel today, and I'm not going to take uh, any more of their time um, or your time and listen to their presentations. I've had a chance to hear everybody in a variety of forums, and we thought this would be a great way to kick off this year and hopefully in the future, uh, looking at the outlook for the uh, coming year in housing and um, where we are and where we think we're going. The, um, Sam Cater is Vice President and Chief Economist of Freddie Mac, and uh, he's got an incredible career, including 11 years at CoreLogic and uh, as a senior economist at Fannie Mae, where I first met him. Um, he's also been a um, economist at the National Association of Realtors and um, has a master's degree in economics uh, from Georgetown University. Uh, the uh, Lawrence Yun is also on the line, and he is the chief economist and senior vice president for research at the National Association of Realtors. And um, his uh, data and analytics uh, help inform 1.3 million real estate professionals all over the country. He also um, is part of the economic forecasting panels for the Blue Chip Council and the Wall Street Journal Forecasting Survey, as well as um, uh, advising the Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard University. Um, his PhD is from the University of Maryland at College Park. And finally, uh, Mike Brandon-Tony, um, who is the Chief Economist and Senior Vice President for Research and Industry Technology at the Mortgage Bankers Association. And um, he has a PhD in economics from Johns Hopkins University uh, and uh, is a graduate of William & Mary and is currently an adjunct prof professor at University of Washington, uh, Johns Hopkins, George Washington, and Georgetown Universities. So um, these are three folks who have just enormous insight and um, bring a lot of um, interesting experience to the table and thought it would be useful to 
kind of look at the housing economy going forward from three uh, different lenses. And uh, without any further ado, um, we can uh, kick it off with um, Sam, and then we'll go to Lawrence, and then wrap it up with Mike and, and, and have time for your questions. So Sam, it's all yours. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to be uh, with you. I want to thank David uh, for the uh, uh, invite. Uh, so uh, here's a quick summary of uh, sort of my comments on page two. Uh, sort of four major points. Uh, economic growth is slowing uh, due to weaker investment and global growth. Uh, there are a couple other reasons that I'll go through as well. Um, however, the strong job market is leading to solid consumer um, spending and uh, the lower rates that we experienced in the sort of uh, last three quarters of 2019 and into uh, 2020 have, uh, have really uh, led to a rebound in sales. However, uh, the supply shortage is, is, is really becoming a governor on sales and, in my opinion, um, is now the biggest obstacle to economic growth that we face in the U.S. So it's not even just about housing anymore. It's about economic growth. And there are uh, several uh, sort of downstream ripple effects from the lack of supply, and I've, I've listed a few of them here on the summary page. Uh, you know, lower household formations and a failure to launch for millennials and, and Gen, Gen Z. Uh, the oldest Gen Z today is about 23 years old, so they're right there on the, on the cusp of uh, the real estate market. I've got a high number of renters that are scrambling for a shrinking uh, amount of inventory and the intense competition driving up uh, prices, particularly on the entry level. And um, moreover, a more recent phenomenon is sort of older, uh, affo more affordable homes being rated by higher income households because of the lack of supply and it's causing more and more for those that can't afford the first time buyers to move further out spatially within a metro area. So if we move to slide three, uh, uh, economic growth, this is a real gross domestic product, the value of all goods and services produced. Uh, in, the, uh, in the U.S., if you go back to sort of early 2017, growth was running on a year-over-year -year basis between 2 and 2.5%, a, two and a sort of good, steady, stable uh, rate. And it really gets a pop in, in, in 2018, particularly in quarters uh, uh, sort of uh, 2 and 3. And that, that was sort of the impact of the tax cuts flowing through uh, to the consumer, uh, and you'll see that on some uh, forthcoming slides. But then once the tax, uh, you know, on a year-over-year -year basis uh, heading into 2019, uh, was sort of uh, no longer really stimulative, and the impact of the tax cuts began to, to fade. Uh, growth began to, to slow closer to where it was uh, before the tax cut uh, occurred. But then it slowed down a little bit more than that, partly because rates also really sort of uh, went up in, in uh, 2019, and then you had all the headwinds from the uh, uh, trade wars uh, that impacted manufacturing, and then you had the slower global economy that also impacted uh, 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 the manufacturing base, not just here, but also um, overseas. So if you move to the next uh, page, that really shows sort of uh, the, the components of uh, GDP that, that show these trends. So for example, on the left-hand side there, I've plotted uh, the uh, percentage point contribution to GDP. Uh, and you can see that typically uh, investment, and this is non-residential and residential. By non-residential, business equipment, um, commercial, things like that. Um, that, uh, uh, the, the combination of the two sort of investment as a whole is contributing anywhere from uh, about 50 basis points to a, a, a one percentage point on, a, on, on average. Uh, you know, you get ups and downs uh, through, the, through the cycle. And then you see that pronounced slowdown in, in 2019. And, and that, was, that was primarily, uh, and there are a couple of reasons. One is the run-up in rates, and it's hard to sort of parse out these effects, but one was the run-up in rates in, in 18. Um, which has an impact on, on and clear and, uh, and strong impact on investment. Uh, you had also uh, the increase in, in uh, sort of oil prices that, that uh, also impacted the, the market, and then, and then really the trade war. You, and you can also see on that slide uh, residential, how it, uh, residential began to subtract from growth. Those are the, the sort of baby blue, light blue bars in uh, 19, uh, in 2019. Uh, and, so, uh, and so at that point, housing was contracting and subtracting from growth. It is now contributing to growth on this chart. On these two charts here, I've got a four-quarter moving average just to kind of smooth out the numbers and it sort of uh, see through the noise a little bit. But residential, as of Q3, uh, just for Q3 alone, was beginning to contribute back to economic growth uh, in the economy, and that's, that's a really uh, a good sign. What's interesting is on the consumption side, because on the consumption side, you see that you get the pop from the tax cuts, so you can clearly see in sort of 17 uh, uh, Q1 through Q3, just sort of a general slowdown, and then you get that pop, 
right? And that's the impact of the the, the tax cuts. And then once the the year over year change, you know, once you once uh, once you uh, start um, comparing uh, consumption on a year over year change after the tax cuts, and and that impact fades away, it kind of goes back to where it was in 20, uh, 2017, And and consumption is moving sideways. So so the really interesting sort of question is why is it that consumers are are spending at a good healthy level, moving sideways, uh, but yet investment. Is, is really shrinking, and the the main reason is is, is confidence moving to page five, uh, and here I've I've um, uh, uh, displayed business confidence uh, in green on the right uh, axis uh, versus consumer confidence in blue on the left axis, and and you can see that consumer confidence has been high and moving sideways, uh, so no real sort of impact from a lot of the noise that you're hearing in the press or the or sort of the the, the trade or tariffs or anything like that. But that is ha had a very strong the, the negative sentiment from trade and, and many of the negative economic headline uh, 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 sort of news stories have have led to a, a pretty good drop in, in business confidence and, and I think that's kind of the split that you're seeing in the economy. There's sort of the investment spending and consumer spending and in investment has uh, decelerated uh, and and declined, uh, but uh, uh, Consumer spending remains uh, at a good uh, steady uh, state. Uh, and why are consumers optimistic? It all goes back to jobs. Uh, so on page six, uh, on the left-hand side, I've plotted uh, initial jobless claims of three months moving average, basically at 50-year lows for for uh, new jobless claims, 50-year uh, lows at, uh, in unemployment. So that's a very good sign. And there, and there are all kinds of issues still in the labor market. Many economists are still having conversations about sort of slack and still underemployment, and those are all true. But the fact remains that we've, we're at 50-year lows in unemployment, and that's good news for uh, consumers and boosting their confidence. And on the right-hand side, you can see why they're confident, and that is there are more job openings. So the first time over the last couple of decades, which is as far back as the data goes, that we've got more job openings than people unemployed, um, which is a really good sign. Um, however, there are some still warning signs that are out there, kind of longer term, and uh, and that show that we're sort of in the late stages of a, of, uh, of an expansion. The Expansion is now uh, 11 years old, longest on record. Here I've plotted sort of three things that I'm, I'm looking at that are providing some warning signs. Um, on the left-hand side, the unemployment rate versus uh, delinquency rate on consumer loans. The delinquency rate on consumer loans has been rising at a good sort of monotonic uh, pace. A lot of this is, is concentrated in credit and auto. Student loans have, uh, the performance on student loans have been sort of moving sideways. But auto and uh, credit card performance has been deteriorating. Keep in mind, it's deteriorating from a very low rate. <laughs> so the absolute level is still low, but it's it's deteriorating, and that is while the unemployment rate has declined still. So that's a little bit of a warning sign. Another is that uh, in the middle slide, um, and it doesn't show up actually well on the way I've plotted it here, but um, uh, it, it basically this is the, the the difference or the gap between uh, consumer confidence today. Um, uh, versus the future, and they're more, much more optimistic about today and right now than the future, and that's usually a, a little bit of a warning sign. And then the last uh, sort of warning sign is corporate profits as a share of uh, GDP have declined, and they typically decline uh, preceding, uh, is usually sort of an indicator of a, res uh, of a recession. The good news is that the level is, is high, or sort of good news or bad, depending on how you look at it, because the, uh, the higher the corporate pro profit share it usually means it's at the expense of labor. Uh, but from uh, from as a sort of indicator of the expansion of the economy, the good news is that it has um, uh, the drop has basically sort of subsided over the past uh, three years or so. It's sort of volatile, but basically moving sideways, and it, the level is still um, high. Turning to quickly to the housing market, uh, existing uh, home sales. Uh, in uh, late 2018, uh, really were falling very rapidly into early 20. That's, that's sort of the trough that you see there in that, on the chart on the left-hand side. And as of December of 2018, home sales were down about 10% year over year over year, and they were running at about 4.7 million, 4.7 million or so. And then rates uh, fell, and there was a little bit of a, a pop, and then a sort of a, a, a good steady increase in sales. But then you get kind of you hit that invisible ceiling right around five. 5.3, 5.4, 5.5 million, kind of the same ceiling that we hit in 2016 through 2017 and early 2018. The speed limit of the housing market seems to be right around 5.5 million. And you can see that's barely above where it was uh, a couple of decades ago, and that's not even adjusting for for population. And 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 the main reason why you can't get higher home sales is there's there's just no um, inventory to buy from. Um, 
And uh, so that's a, a, a major issue, and then we can see a little bit more on that on page nine here, where we've plotted uh, completions, uh, uh, single family, multifamily uh, sort of units that have actually been completed and manufactured home, home uh, shipments. And you can see that today, as of 2019, and uh, I've got a, that's the light blue bar at the very end of the chart. Um, uh, and uh, that's through November on a year-to-date basis, and the December data just came out. So once you include the December data, it's a very small increase over uh, uh, 2018. But bottom line takeaway from this is that here we are 11 years into the expansion, and we're still constructing at recession-type levels, right? If you go back the last time that uh, prior to the Great Recession, the last uh, a couple of major uh, recessions that we had were in the early 90s and early 80s, and we were building uh, at the trough <laughs> of the recession about what we're building today 11 years into the expansion. Huge, huge uh, warning sign um, because this sort of uh, brings up the issue, well, what's going to happen at the next recession, right? And, and we're, we're underbuilding by 300K already, about 300K to 350K a year, and this is a major issue. So what are the impacts? I'll just go through them very quickly on beginning on page 10. What are the impacts of the uh, lack of supply? Uh, a is that more, uh, it impacts household formation. So household formations have uh, decline. You can see that on the left-hand uh, uh, side. This typically happens uh, during recessions, but it was more pronounced um, uh, this time. It leads to more young people living at home. We've heard of many times about how millennials, the percentage of them living at home is, is rising. Here we've focused narrowly on the youngest millennials and oldest uh, Gen Z cohort, which is, I think, 23-year-olds year old in, in, in 2020, and, and, and you know, about a third of them are, are living at home. And and you know it hasn't that 19 sort of uh, uh, drop. I don't know how much to trust that. I want a few more years worth of data to see if that's a real trend or not. Uh, but bottom line is that in theory, in a good expansion, the percentage of uh, these young people living at home should be declining because the economy is doing well. They can get on the economic ladder, get jobs, get places to live, and and move out of their parents' home. But they're they're not doing that. Um, Impact number two, renters are scrambling for shrinking inventory. Here I plotted the number of renters per available home uh, for sale. So you can see that today the number of renters um, uh, looking uh, for inventory is twice, the, more than twice the level it was in the early 80s. Um, and so that's, that's a, a warning sign. Um, the, and then, you know, no surprise when you have not enough supply and too much demand, you get a pop in home prices. If you focus on the right-hand side there, I've plotted uh, – uh, home price changes uh, year over year basis. Is the the middle bar charts overall home prices running uh, a shade under four, about three seven, three eight or so uh, percent. But what's interesting is that uh, if you uh, break out home prices into sort of the luxury price tier and then the entry level uh, price tier, entry level prices are going up a lot more than than overall home prices. And you'd be shocked at some of these entry level home prices. The year over year change in some of the hottest markets like in Idaho and Utah, they're up. 12, 13, 14, 15 percent year over year basis. Uh, so these are the markets that are growing the fastest. They've got fast population growth, but they are rapidly becoming unaffordable. And so this is a major uh, issue. Uh, moving on to page 13, uh, the fourth impact of the supply shortage are, are, is that older homes are being rated by higher income households. And so here we've done something interesting. We took Freddie Mac's data and we looked at uh, the prices, or excuse me, the incomes flowing into uh, uh, n new homes. The theory behind this is that when you, you know, sort of the builders always joke, we've never built affordable housing. Uh, it just depreciated into affordability. It's sort of like, you know, you can't afford that new BMW, but after six or seven years, uh, it depreciates into affordability. Same thing with housing. And so uh, that theory has been out there for a while. It's been um, documented in, in, in uh, census type data. Here we use our own Freddie Mac data to track the incomes flowing through new construction. And so you can see on the left-hand side how the real incomes of uh, uh, homeowners as they uh, get into new homes declines over time, consistent with the theory and consistent with the, the research and the data. However, over the last few years, it's begun to increase, meaning it's filtering up. And this is because more higher income people are starting to flow into these, uh, this uh, uh, affordable stock and, and crowding out those in the middle uh, income ranges. And on the right-hand side there, uh, and this is the nice thing about having Freddie data and using it like census-type data for research, uh, we can do we can look at uh, smaller granular areas, and you can see that um, 
the, the sort of the very active uh, hot markets like in Atlanta or Chicago, or excuse me, Atlanta or D.C., uh, has, has been filtering up uh, for a while now uh, versus kind of some of the other colder markets like a Detroit or Chicago, which where you're seeing that more normal filtering and, and these new homes depreciate into affordability. And then the last impact that I've plotted here is on page 14. Um, uh, more and more first-time home buyers are moving uh, out to the suburbs. So here, again, we took uh, Freddie Mac's data and we looked at the distance. We basically, uh, this, we did this for the 50 largest metros and um, we, uh, basically took the sort of Euclidean distance between the city center and all first-time home buyers and plotted them sort of on, on a map. And so the way you read this is the distance for this, uh, and, and we put them in quartiles. So the inner uh, sort of inner ring uh, quartile of first-time home buyers on average were buying homes about nine miles from the city center in 1994. And then you get that return to the city phenomenon. And so more and more sort of people are coming into the cities and, and you see that sort of peaks in early 2011, and I've seen some other work that shows that kind of that you, you're getting that same sort of effect, yet that yes, there's a lot of people sort of crowding into, into cities, but they're, they're getting so unaffordable that now you're getting a reversal and more and more people are heading out further out. And if you drew this line for the hottest cities, it would, draw that, it would, it would show that, that that line is going up at a, fast, uh, a faster rate. So more and more people being, particularly first-time home buyers, are being crowded out and having to travel further. Um, and that puts sort of stress on the family and having time uh, for uh, sort of yourself. And with that, I will stop uh, there and turn it back over to Nathan. Sweet. Thank you, Sam. That was uh, wonderful. Um, great. Well, I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Lawrence um, with the uh, National Association of Realtors. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, yes, I don't have a slide. Uh, I am out of the office, uh, so if you can bear with me. Uh, I have been uh, visiting five local associations recently, a uh, diverse group uh, you know, from Atlanta uh, to Greenwich, Connecticut, where they are seeing a sizable price decline. Uh, today, uh, I am in Fairfield, North Carolina, a very small size, I guess, metro. Uh, stable prices. Uh, so I've been talking to the realtors because they are asking the same question, uh, what to expect in 2020. Uh, given that I don't have slide and uh, Sam obviously you know, went through a lot of detailed numbers, uh, let me give you a sort of more of a broader uh, 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 scope on the how we view housing market uh, condition and what I am relaying to our uh, realtor members. Uh, I say uh, first that the buying condition, you know, one looks at 3.5% mortgage rates, uh, unemployment rate at 3.5% uh, rate, uh, and then you have all-time high in stock market, uh, wages uh, beginning to pick up. So this is like one of the best time ever uh, to enter the market. So the buyer traffic that we hear from the realtors are saying, yes, people are looking around. Uh, we see more traffic at open houses. This winter, interestingly, compared to other winters, uh, much stronger in terms of traffic, uh, lockbox opening, just qualitative measures. Uh, hard data, uh, we have one coming out uh, tomorrow. Uh, that is an embargo figure, uh, which I cannot discuss. Uh, but the overall qualitative number shows that this winter has been quite a, a better one compared to other winter uh, months. Now, of course, we have an easy comparison from one year ago, uh, because just one year ago, uh, there was a constant talk of a potential economic recession and also potential housing market recession. Uh, mortgage rate had hit 5%. Stock market was crashing. A lot of discussion about uh, recession in the media, uh, but after 12 months today, uh, in essence, uh, we have exactly the opposite. Uh, you know, no recession in sight, uh, stock market hitting record high, and mortgage rates still remaining at uh, favorable rates. So the buyer traffic remains healthy, uh, and the realtors are working with buyer clients, but the challenges they are facing is the lack of inventory. Uh, just not enough. Uh, the most recently available data on the inventory was as of November, and it was the lowest November inventory we ever recorded since we began tracking 
uh, all the way back to 1982 on the single family, uh, you know, excluding the condominiums. Uh, so this shows how low we are, uh, considering the fact that inventories are raw numbers, not adjusted for the population increases that America has encountered. Um, so if we have more inventory, uh, certainly uh, we can get more home sales to be clicking. Uh, from NAR perspective, uh, we have been fervently advocating for increased home construction uh, because that starts the chain reaction of more existing home inventory. Uh, generally, people who buy new homes are not the first-time buyers, but the trade-up buyers or trade-down buyers. Uh, but in the process of trading up or trading down, uh, they are releasing their old home onto the market, uh, which smooth out the inventory for the existing home market. So new home construction is what's needed. Sam went over that figures to show that even uh, 11 years after the recovery, uh, if we were to just uh, look at the past housing starts, uh, one would say that we are in a recessionary condition or housing start number uh, even though the, uh, you know, year after year is showing marginal gains, but at 1.2, 1.3 million housing start, uh, that is below historical average and generally associated with a recessionary condition. Uh, so this multiple year of underproduction is the key reason uh, why we have the housing shortage on the existing home side, uh, which has been very frustrating for our members. Uh, consequently, uh, home prices have been rising strongly, lack of inventory, uh, and consistently outpacing people's income, uh, sometimes rising twice as fast as people's income growth, uh, and as hurting affordability. Uh, fortunately, we have this low mortgage rate, but let's say we were to bounce off this low rates uh, into, say, 4.5% mortgage rates, or say even 5% mortgage rates. 5% uh, mortgage rate will be considered very attractive from long-term historical perspective, but we saw last year when the mortgage rate hit 5%, buyers quickly retreated. So even in a good economy, uh, the buyers appear to be sensitive to changes in mortgage rate, especially after uh, many people are accustomed to the 4% uh, mortgage rate condition. Uh, so uh, affordability is becoming a challenge. Uh, we are already seeing in the highly unaffordable markets like California, uh, you know, large out-migration of people, uh, and they have greatly helped, uh, or the people's migrating, uh, that has helped the nearby states of Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Nevada, uh, Arizona. Uh, uh, but what we are beginning to see is that, for example, Boise, Idaho, uh, which has been one of the leading cities in terms of job creation, about 4% annual growth, uh, the latest job figure in November, I think their year-over-year uh, -year job gain was only like 1.5%. So uh, in places like Idaho, where it used to be affordable, but now much less affordable, uh, is beginning to hit the uh, job market conditions. Uh, so in other words, housing unaffordability could be a drag to job creation going forward uh, unless people begin to identify other markets to move into. I mean, certainly like feel where I am today, I mean, it's certainly affordable, but there are not a quality, a quality jobs around. Uh, and, and, you know, they're not getting any big boost in job creation. Um, uh, the other thing that NAR uh, is looking into uh, is the changes in the tax law. Uh, you know, everyone is familiar with the limitation on the mortgage interest deduction, property tax deduction, or the broadly the SALT uh, impact. Um, you know, we think that SALT is pretty much a done deal. Uh, there will not be any changes to it. Uh, if there is some type of compromise, only compromise that we see is possibly reducing the marriage or eliminating the marriage penalty of $10,000 in SALT. Uh, since 10000 is available for single tax filers, uh, for two-person married couple, uh, they should be able to deduct 20000 You know, so maybe that would be a compromise uh, maybe not this year, but maybe after the election. So that's possibility. Uh, but uh, we are looking at every uh, different possible tax incentive to see if uh, America, are we satisfied with the current tax code as is with, you know, people no longer uh, using mortgage interest deduction as a home buying incentive, or should there be some type of home uh, tax credit to induce people to come into the market? 
Uh, the other thing that we are looking into is uh, the uh, booth inventory outside of the home construction, uh, and that is to inv- real estate investors who have gobbled up the property this past 10 years. Uh, if they sell the property, you know, they face that capital gains tax. Uh, it could that be some kind of reduction in capital gains tax rate to induce investors to unload. So, uh, you know, we are studying the issues. We have not come out with any policy position, uh, but the realtors have given us direction to look into it to see what the potential impact uh, could be uh, in uh, that area. Um, but the, uh, the uh, underlying question about uh, outlook for 2020 and beyond, what I have been saying to the realtors is essentially that as one visualized over the next five years, that four of those five years should be an improving year. Uh, one year, some little hiccup uh, for some unforeseen external factors, uh, but I feel very confident that next four years, four out of five years will be an improving years in terms of home sales, uh, as well as home prices. Uh, first on home prices, just because we are in housing shortage, I think we will get some relief, but definitely not a glut of homes, uh, and as home prices uh, should be rising but hopefully in line with income growth and not outpacing income growth. Uh, And that would depend upon how much inventory shows up in the market. Related to the demand, uh, I feel confident that, you know, four of the next five years will be an improving year just because let's compare year 2019 that is completed versus year 2000. Uh, Now, year 2000, using that as a reference, you know, just because, uh, you know, one may say it's a turn of the century, but... Uh, more importantly, that was a year where uh, there was not too much discussion about foreclosure crisis or housing market bubble. Uh, real estate news in year 2000 was quite boring. Uh, and if boring is normal, uh, using that reference, uh, what we are finding is that housing prices are actually more affordable today compared to year 2000. And you say, well, home prices have risen a lot. Uh, how is that possible? Well, mortgage rates were 8% back then. Today, it is under 4%. So that mortgage rate difference is helping on the affordability. Population is about 50 million more people living in the country. Household formation, 20 million more. Job creation, 20 million more. So we have a condition of more people living in the country with jobs uh, and better affordability thanks to the low rates. Yet home sales today are actually lighter compared to year 2000. Uh, It's implying that there must be a sizable pent up demand. Unless we have a shift in millennial generation who think home ownership is not uh, part of their American dream. A survey by many organizations show that uh, millennials, uh, they may say they don't wanna buy today, but certainly regarding ownership in the future years, they all say they would like to own at some point in the future. So given that aspiration, we think that there is a pent-up demand in the pipeline. And as long as the economy continues to grow and we see the mortgage rates remaining low, um, some of the European countries have a negative interest rate. So given that, uh, even with large budget deficits we have in the U.S., uh, the interest rate could be uh, favorable, at least in the near to intermediate term. And given those conditions uh, and the pent-up demand, uh, we see home sales expected to uh, steadily rise uh, in the next four to four of the five years. Uh, so fairly comfortable. This is what I have been relaying to the uh, realtor members. Uh, and in some cities, you know, so some cities will clearly outpace others, uh, including a couple of North Carolina cities like Charlotte and Raleigh, relative affordability. Uh, you know, some cities in Utah, strong my in-migration patterns. Uh, so there will be some local market variation uh, and also the uh, salt impacted areas like Greenwich, Connecticut or California market, uh, they may stall, uh, meaning that you know, home prices could flatten out uh, or even decline uh, because of the salt issues, uh, especially on the high end. Uh, but otherwise, we are quite comfortable in terms of you know, increased business opportunity for realtors, uh, which means that from the public policy perspective, uh, increase home sales, increase housing starts, uh, which are, you know, the economic uh, boost uh, to the broader uh, economy.
so with that, uh, thank you for allowing me uh, to participate in this uh, uh, first of the session. Thank you. Great, thank you, Lawrence. Uh, and even without slides, that was very informative and interesting, so we appreciate it. Um, all right, now I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Mike, who's gonna close us out. Great, thanks a lot, and uh, always a pleasure to have a panel like this with Sam and Lawrence. It's great to get their perspectives. I'm really not gonna disagree with anything that they've said, but uh, provide a little bit different perspective. Uh, if we go ahead to my first slide, just a summary of our outlook. I would characterize our views as really pretty cautious about the near term. You can see here that our forecast for economic growth for 2020 shows a, a pretty weak year relative to the prior years and what we're expecting in 21 and 22. This is really sort of the consequence of, of the trade war last year, and I think sort of but for the interest rate cuts that the Fed provided through 2019, uh, we would have been in a worse situation right now. The trade war does seem to not be getting worse, right? So we just had the deal signed with China and perhaps the Mexico-Canada deal will get finalized here and does seem like perhaps some of the tensions with Europe are cooling down. All of that positive, uh, but sort of couple again, sort of the consequences from that with the shutdown at Boeing and Sam showed the picture of business confidence, the news coming out from International Monetary Fund and elsewhere. Global growth is very slow. The U.S. has not been able to escape that, and some of these policy decisions and policy uncertainties are leading to a much slower growth environment in 2020. A consequence of that is that we expect the, the job market's gonna get somewhat weaker this year, and it's important to really keep that in context. That means moving from a 50-year low in the unemployment rate at 3.5% to maybe hitting 4% by next year. Uh, but that'll show up in various ways. Job openings are declining. You, I think you'll begin to see initial claims for unemployment insurance increase. Wage growth is slowing. And for the December number, you'll see the, the monthly job numbers slow down. But uh, again, keep it in context of after an extraordinary decade of growth in the job market, just think it's gonna be a little bit weaker in 2020 and next year. That's gonna be enough, we think, to keep the Fed on the sidelines. So we think short-term rates are really gonna be stuck in place at least the next 12, if not the next 18 months. Couple that with this economic picture, we just don't think mortgage rates are gonna move very much from where they are today. So it's a bit misleading to show it as we do here where we say, you know, 3.7 last year, 3.7 this year. Those are annual averages. Right. For anybody in the business or a potential homeowner, day to day, just because of the uncertainty in the world, rates can be jumping up and down, you know, quarter percentage point up or down from that point. But we think if we come back in this time next year, uh, we will see that the annual average didn't move much in 20 relative to 19. Let's go ahead to the next slide. As you might guess, uh, being from the Mortgage Bankers Association, I tend to be a little bit mortgage focused. So one of the things that my members look to us for is a forecast of mortgage origination volume. 2019 was a very, very good year for mortgage originators, uh, over two trillion in volume. That was really helped along by a, a boost in refi activity in the second half of the year as rates dropped you know, well below 4% after rates had touched 5% at the end of 2018. That's the blue line here on this chart. But what a lot of my members focus on and what we spend a lot of time uh, discussing through our data is, is the red line, is what's happening with the purchase market? You know, purchase and sale of homes, changes in home prices. And while I'm a little bit cautious about the outlook for 2020, I am really quite bullish about purchase origination volume, home sales over the next four or five years. So if I were to draw out this chart to 2024, 2025, that red line would keep increasing. And the reason I'm optimistic about this over the medium term really is focusing on some of the demographics that both Sam and, and Lawrence have talked about. We think household formation has been and will continue to be strong 
and millennials are at the age now where they are, parentheses, finally buying homes. Let's go ahead to the next slide. So for folks who have been homeowners over the past decade, it's been a pretty extraordinary run. So Lawrence mentioned that in many years you had home prices growing at twice the rate of income growth. So the blue line here is from the Federal Reserve showing total owner's equity in real estate. So back at the worst part of the crisis, that had dropped to about $8 trillion. We are above $18 trillion now. So a $10 trillion gain in home equity for most households, 65% uh, almost that own their home. This is by far the largest asset, and it has grown extraordinarily in value. Interesting thing that this chart is also showing, the green line, is that unlike in the pre-crisis housing boom, people are just much more reluctant to borrow against their home equity than have been the case previously. Uh, there's a lot of student debt out there. There's a lot of auto debt out there. Sam talked a bit about delinquencies in some of those categories. But mortgage delinquencies are at 25-year lows. And people, again, are just showing some reluctance to borrow against this equity, maybe a little bit less willing to believe it's going to be there. Um, but a tremendous form of wealth for, for people who have become homeowners. Let's go ahead to the next one. So the demographic story that I told you about, uh, you know, typically in the U.S. over the past couple of decades, U.S. Uh, forms about a million households per year. And what this chart is showing is in blue, the net growth in owner households, in red, the net growth in renter households. So prior to the crisis, most of the net increase in households was on the owner side. We saw the home ownership rate increase to a record 69%. Then you had the crisis for a couple of years there, not a lot of household formation at all, people doubling up, college students coming back after graduation, living, living in the basement. By the time you get to the middle of the last decade, back up to a million households per year, but almost all of that gain on the renter side, we saw the homeownership rate drop below 63%. 2017, something happened, so the light switch came on, Relative cost of renting versus owning changed. Millennials, instead of being 24, 25, 26, were 28, 29, 30, approaching peak first-time homebuyer age. And then beginning in 2017, you see the color of those bars change and a huge jump in household formation. Our expectation is that over this decade that we're in the middle of right now, instead of a million households per year, we're going to get a million and a half. Um, and that will split roughly... Uh, 65-35, owner-renter, so a lot of new owner households, a lot of new renter households, a tremendous amount of housing demand, a lot of need for housing to be financed, single-family, multifamily, manufactured, everything. So I think for everybody, part of this community just to recognize that at least for the next four or five years, you just have this wave of housing demand hitting the economy. And even if the broader economy is somewhat weaker, I think we're going to power through on the housing side just based upon this demographic demand. Let's go ahead to the next slide. Now, that demand, uh, and Sam highlighted this in some of his slides, really is more likely to be at the entry level. These are first-time home buyers, right? So uh, more likely to be uh, lower home prices, maybe a little bit further out, smaller properties. and supply, at least right now, not meeting that demand where it is strongest. And what I'm showing here is data from our mortgage application survey and showing for different loan size buckets sort of where that demand has been strongest, where it's been inconsistent. And it really is two different markets. So sort of the core of the conforming portion of the market, that first-time buyer and first move-up buyer, steady growth, double-digit last several years. Where we see a lot of volatility, and, uh, let's look at that yellowish colored line there, at the high end of the market, these are the folks impacted by that lack of business confidence. These are the folks worried about the, the dive in the stock market at the end of 2018. These are the folks benefiting from the run-up in the stock market in 19. So different portions of this distribution are going to be differently impacted by policy changes, by news about global growth, by 
some of the various uncertainties we have in the world where your typical young family looking to buy their first home, they're kind of abstracting from that. And if their own job situation looks good, their own financial situation looks good, they're going to plow ahead and make that decision to buy a home. So our expectation, again, the next several years is just steady, consistent growth out of that first-time home buyer portion of the market, and we'll see some volatility uh, at the higher end. Let's go ahead to the next slide. Now, part of what's happened in the post-crisis environment is credits remain somewhat tighter, partly as a result of markets, partly as a result of regulatory changes. And for a number of reasons, I mentioned student debt, you see first-time home buyers coming to that decision to buy a little later than otherwise. So this is just looking at distribution of uh, household income for first-time home buyers. And you can see a bit of a shift over the past several years towards somewhat higher income. You'd see the same shift if you looked at percentage of college graduates or if you looked at uh, size of down payment. Uh, all of these things reflecting that your, your typical first-time home buyer today, somewhat older, somewhat higher income, somewhat uh, better positioned to make that purchase than would have been the case certainly in the pre-crisis environment when people were buying younger uh, and somewhat less ready than, than certainly is the case today. Let's go ahead to the next slide. Sort of broadening the, the perspective a little bit, Th this is a, uh, one of our favorite pictures in the MBA research group, and it's looking uh, across a couple of different dimensions at affordability. Uh, obviously, I think for, for an NHC audience, sort of thinking about affordable housing and all its permutations is, is absolutely front and center. So what are we showing here? So you see the, the zero in the middle of the page and the black line. Everything to the left of that line is counting the number of renter households in each income bucket by year. Everything to the right of that line is looking at the number of owner households in each income bucket by year. And then the colors, the green is no burden, so a household spending less than 30% of their income on housing, whether rented or owned. Uh, yellow is moderate, so 30 to 50, and uh, Red is severe, so spending more than 50% of their income on housing. So uh, I've got my, my colleague, Amy Woodrow, likes to say that if you, if you were on a desert island and you only had one chart, this might be it. That probably says more about us than about anything else. But um, just t you know, take some time to sort of study this one, because you know, everything it says about sort of the nature of housing markets and where housing policy may or may not be more needed uh, one thing it says to me is that for, for renters, the affordable housing uh, concern slash crisis really is at the lower end. Look at that proportion of households in the yellow and red and less than 30000 in income. Right? You have a number of renter households really, really struggling to get by. Um, on the owner side, it is a very different picture. Right? It's uh, folks that are owning, you know, even at the 75000 and above, these are in millions of households, millions of households spending, you know, more than 30% of their income, but making 75000 a year. And, you know, we're sitting in the uh, D.C. market right now, and that's not hard to believe at all, right? That you would have to go out pretty far from Center City, D.C. to find something that a 75000 income could support. Uh, but lots of markets in the country are like that. Right, so when people say there's an affordable housing crisis, they could be pointing to any of the four quadrants of, of this chart, you know, perhaps uh, minus the, the lower left, that uh, 75000 and above renter, that, that's a pretty, pretty high-end renter in, in most markets in the country. So again, just a visualization of some of the affordable challenges that, that folks are, are really focusing on. And then last slide, just, just emphasizing that again, that uh, in most markets in the country, and here this is looking nationally, that uh, cost burden for homeowners has come down a bit, uh, particularly due to the ability to refinance into these historically low mortgage rates and bring down payments. Uh, where on the right, the uh, number of cost burden renters has, has remained quite high and really to the prior chart concentrated in you know, modest to, to lower income households. So 
uh, again, might uh, impact how you're thinking about sort of the nature of the affordable housing issue more broadly. And obviously, there are differences across geographic markets. So uh, I guess maybe one, one more for me, and then to sort of close out. But um, you know, our outlook, as I said, a little bit cautious about 2020, given the uh, headwinds that the broader economy faces, but really, really optimistic about home sales and construction and housing demand over the next several years, given the demographic tailwinds that we're all going to benefit from. So, Nathan, let me turn it back to you. Great. Thank you, Mike, and thanks to um, all of our panelists for those really insightful presentations. Um, we have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, we'd love to get the chance to um, have some folks, uh, you know, engage on the line. What I'm going to do is, uh, after I kind of, we kind of go through this first question, I'm going to unmute the folks who are on so that if you want to ask a question, you'll have an opportunity. We'll probably be able to take two or three. Um, but before I do that, I just want to let everyone make sure that everyone is is physically muting their phone before I unmute your ID so we don't have a wave of sound. Um, so if you could please make sure that your phone itself is muted while I unmute everyone and also ask kind of the first um, leading question to our, to our panelists. Um, and that being, um, you know, there you all were touching and discussing, um, you know, a number of uh, uh, at least uh, indications that folks are wary about what's happening. If anything, there's a lot of, you know, news stories about, oh, are we going to head into a recession or not? Um, so it's, I, I really appreciate everyone kind of um, addressing that, that question. Um, I'm wondering for aspiring home buyers, um, how would you maybe, like, what, what kind of advice would you give um, to, to navigate this kind of time if someone's thinking, well, I, I, I want to buy a home, but I'm seeing this news and I'm, I'm not quite sure what, I, you know, how I should be navigating this. Um, maybe if you can just parse out what, what that might look like a little bit. So uh, I'll go ahead and start. Uh, so with respect to the first question about the um, slowdown in the economy, I think there, uh, since the Great Recession, the economy remains fragile, and so I think the downside risks are elevated. Um, I think in this mini, most recent mini slowdown, I think the worst is over. And the main reason is just the consumer. Um, again, because the, the, un, the uh, unemployment rate is so low, uh, wage growth has been flat, but what's really interesting is wage growth on the bottom end has really picked up in a material way uh, in the past couple of years. That's probably because the unemployment is, is rate is uh, really tight and there's demand for the marginal uh, person coming into the labor market, but then also because the minimum wage has, has, has picked up. And with, with a lot of these folks, um, you know, there's been at least 40 states that have been that have increased their minimum wages over the past few years, and quite a few of them have increased it in uh, at least twice. Um, and with a lot of these folks who are down at that part of the income spectrum, the marginal propensity to consume is very high. In other words, for every dollar that's incrementally flowing in, they're going to go out and spend that. And so that has... Um, uh, uh, multipliers. So that's one reason. Another is I, I think you know the drop in, in, in rates has really caused the housing market to rebound. And last year it was subtracting from growth. This year it will add to growth. And I think that's a that's a, a big deal. So while I agree with Mike that the 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 risks are there, I think I think in we're now at a good place um, um, in the cycle. In terms of sort of advice for aspiring um, home buyers, I think if if uh, I think if you if your outlook is to buy and hold, I think you you uh, and you have the income and the and and the credit, it is by far the best way to uh, generate uh, wealth. You saw Mike's chart on owners uh, on owners um, uh, equity. The majority of wealth in the U.S. and by majority, I would say for kind of at the 90th percentile down for all those folks. Uh, their wealth is primarily primarily their home equity, um, and so uh, what I, I'm concerned uh, in terms of millennials today. There was actually this really interesting stat I saw from the Federal Reserve the other day that said that uh, uh, about 35 uh, percent of the home equity wealth in the U.S. was owned by uh, sort of those under 34, something like that. In 1990, today it's 4 percent, and that's because their home ownership rate for millennials has has, has declined. Um, and they haven't been able to ride that run-up in in, uh, in in home equity. And so, so I think if you have the income and you have the credit, 
Um, I think you. I think the problem is for them is they've got to find the right home, but you've got to be able to compromise. When you have a limited inventory, you're not going to find the exact home, the exact location, but you just got to get in the market. If you get in there, then you can trade up at some point down the line, years uh, years uh, down the line. So, so I, I think because you know, again, homeownership is one of the best way to generate wealth, and if you have the means and ability to do it, uh, and uh, with the realistic. Um, Sort of uh, um, view the fact that there's a very limited inventory, as, as Lawrence uh, has stated, and, and we've talked about, and that you've just got to compromise in terms of sort of you know the, the location, amenities, the actual property, things like that. And if you compromise, you can find a, a, a place and, and be able to jump in the market and ride that wave that that um, Mike talked about. Great. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, I'm going to go ahead and unmute. Uh, the folks on the line, uh, our codes, if I was just muted, it is, it is, yeah, yeah. Thanks again. Who hasn't returned your call? Um, okay, we're going to go back to muting everyone. Uh, you can unmute yourself if you have uh, your laptop open. So. Um, we can go uh, about it that way, but I'll hop into um, some of the questions that have been submitted. Um, so someone is asking, um, you know, if we're seeing a return to the drive till you qualify phenomena where folks are moving out of the city core to find more affordable housing, is there any concern of the impact of combined housing and transportation costs? Um, and they cite that some studies found high rates of foreclosure in the late 2000s connected to higher combined costs. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I, I thought Sam's chart on that was fascinating. This, this is Mike. Um, you know, for a number of reasons, it does seem like uh, oil prices are somewhat more stable these days than they were previously, a lot from the uh, fracking revolution in the United States and the fact that just able to produce a lot more and less reliant on, on imports. But you know, right before the crisis, oil prices essentially tripled, and I think they, that certainly was a contributing factor in some of those outlying areas. So, um, on a, on a look forward basis, you obviously can't guarantee anything, but uh, I think it is one of those uh, factors to consider in a household consideration when they're budgeting. Yes, I'm getting a lower home price, but now I'm going to be spending a third more on you know gas and maintenance for the, for the vehicle. I think that's that's a household level decision. I don't know if that'll work its way into developer or you know lender level decisions but certainly makes sense for households to think about it. I'll just add this is Sam, I'll just add one quick thing. If you look from a household budget perspective, uh, shelter is uh, the biggest uh, budget item on the typical household category, whether that's owning or renting. Second biggest category, transportation. So uh, the more that you spend uh, the, uh, um, you're going to spend more the further out that you uh, that you live, and the, and then you're going to be subject to market forces such as oil prices, which I believe just about before every single recession has spiked. <laughs> there is a relationship there, and that is a concern. And that and 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 energy costs take up a bigger budget of the the uh, middle and lower middle uh, income households, and so it is. It is something to be concerned about, and we're already seeing auto delinquencies deteriorate, and yeah. so that tells you something about uh, the, the ability of, of consumers to handle their uh, auto debt. Also, speaks to the need for developers and planners to think about transit when they're thinking Absolutely. about farther. Great. Okay, we have time for one more quick question. Um, if someone wants to ask that, they can go ahead. Um, otherwise, we are running right up on the hour. Okay, here's some folks maybe uh, unmuted. Um. Hello. Hi there. Hey, uh, my name is Sahan, and I'm actually uh, I'm actually a millennial myself. I just graduated, and I'm here in my second day of my job. And uh, mm -hmm. I do have I do have a question related to student loans. I know that a lot of millennials in the uh, millennials have been struggling to be homeowners, uh, mainly because of student loans. They already have a lot of debt already. They don't have money to put on more debt for a home. Are you guys concerned about the student loan, uh, the, the, how much student loans are there in the market and how that's going to affect households in the future? Uh, so household ownership? Sure, yeah. yeah. Uh, Lawrence, any, sorry, uh, Lawrence, any opinion on that, or do you want Mike and I to chime in? 
Uh, uh, yes. Uh, so, you know, 1.24 trillion, uh, that is a uh, three times higher than just a decade ago. Uh, any economic variable that moves up that much, we should be wondering why that's the case. Now, irrespective of that, uh, our study shows that people with student debt, uh, they are delaying their home ownership uh, entry point by roughly five to seven years. So someone who may have planned on you know, purchasing a home in their late 20s are now looking at in mid-30s. Uh, now, these are attitudinal surveys. Uh, and also in terms of the mortgage qualifying, you know, the numbers also makes it more burdensome. Uh, but I think there's also a psychological impact. At least we are seeing it on our survey to say that people do not want to carry too large debt at the same time. Um, and hence, uh, without a doubt, student debt will be a drag to home ownership uh, in the upcoming years. Great. Thank, Thank you, you. Lawrence. Um, all right. And that brings us right up to the hour. So again, we want to uh, thank all of our uh, panelists, uh, Sam Lawrence and Mike. Thank you for joining us. This was wonderful. Um, for folks on the line and who uh, registered online, we will be sending out a copy of the presentation slides to everyone. So um, you can go back and, and uh, check that out. Um, and please feel free to reach out. I know that there was a lot of other questions we didn't get to. So please feel free to reach out um, over email and we'll be happy to engage further. Um, all right, thanks to all for joining us and see you on the next webinar.